Well, good morning. I was, um, I was contemplating this cold weather this morning, and, and the only thing that I could think of is that you've imported too many people from Minnesota. <laughs> well, we're glad that they're here, too, and we've enjoyed getting to know them a little bit while we've been here. <clears throat> Today we want to talk about this same topic, creation evolution, and see how how it, um, how it, uh, am I getting feedback? I'm getting feedback to me. <coughs> how uh, it affects moral issues. And so we're going to look at that a little bit today, and I think we'll have time at the end of this to, um, to ask some other questions that maybe you've had along the way. So what we want to do today is we're going to look at four areas. We're going to look at morality. We're going to look at race. We're going to look at life. And we're going to look at sexuality. So let's start with morality. Morality, what, is, um, what does the Bible teach us about morality? How do we define, think about morality? Creation says that the Bible teaches us that God is the creator. That, that is the most important basis for this whole thing. Do I need to do something different here with my feedback? I'm sorry. Just keep going. Okay, so God, God is the creator. That's the basis for all, the, that, uh, all of morality and that all things belong to God. If he, if he is the author and the creator of all things, that means that he makes the rules. This is a problem for the world because they don't like the world, somebody else to make the rules. And so in, in contrast to... Uh, in contrast to creation, evolution, basically, what, what is it based on? It's based on man's ideas. That means in a room this size, we have 60 different ideas. If we're not, if we're not basing it on some absolute authority, meaning God's word, then there is no basis. It's very illogical to reason about what's right and wrong. We, we, there's no basis to do that. It's, very, it's actually irrational. It's arbitrary. When you think about logic, one of the th things that destroys arguments are when things are arbitrary. Because mine is no different than yours. If that's the basis that, that we do things. <clears throat> and actually even to talk about morality from an evolutionary standpoint, wh what's right and wrong with evolution? Where does that come from? We have to borrow from a Christian worldview even to get that concept. There is no inherent right and wrong in evolution. What, what, is, what, is chance, what does chance have to do with absolutes? See, the, 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 these are diametrically opposed. So when you think about morality, there's a huge divide between creation and evolution. The two don't go together at all. So now we want to talk about what's, what gets everybody fired up today. Everyone gets fired up today about, uh, um, about race. I mean, you know, if, if, if you can't win an argument, you say, well, the, this is just, it's racial. That's, that, that's, the, that's the default position today. I mean, if you, can't, if you can't win an argument or you don't want to talk about it, it's racial. And so there's been a huge divide that's come into our country, but it's really more than just our country, but we see it in our country today um, with this whole race card thing. Now, we're not talking about cards that you collect. <laughs> and if you're from Kentucky, we're not even talking about the race card at the track. We're not talking about those things. We're going to talk about racism in a different way. Stephen Jay Gould, who's, he's now dead, but he was a Harvard paleontologist. And he was, he was one of the most um, um, read and knowledgeable guys about evolution um, for, until his death for a long time before that. He wrote some very, very um, sophisticated articles about evolution. This is what he says about evolution and racism. He says, biological arguments for racism may have been common before 1850, 
but they increase by orders of magnitude following the acceptance of evolutionary theory. So, you go back in time before 1850 and people had prejudices and they were ratio in that they, one guy is better than another guy and it may be based on some external thing. But something happened in the 1850s. You, you know what happened in the 1850s? 1859, Darwin publishes his book, The Origin of the Species. And if you look at the subtitle of that book, it says, um, it talks about the favored races. So Gould, uh, so Gould acknowledges that something really started speeding up when we're talking about racism, and it has to do with this idea of evolution. <clears throat> we see it very clearly in, in the 20th century under Hitler. Hitler was strongly influenced by evolutionary thought with this idea of survival of the fittest. And of course, when you think about survival of the fittest, it's your race that needs to be the one that survives. And so he was, he was a very strong racist. And he was against the Jews. He was against other minorities as well. And he said this in his book, Mein Kampf. He said, as an agent of our creator, be careful, be careful of wolves in sheep's clothing. As an agent of our creator, Hitler used the church as part of his justification for this extermination of the Jews. As an agent of our creator, by fighting off the Jews, I'm doing the Lord's work. This idea of survival of the fittest is ingrained in the sin nature of man, and it raises its head very, very easily. Uh, this is a this is a reminder of the of the riots in Baltimore that took place. Um, this lady, uh, if you don't know this lady, you need to know this lady. Her name was Margaret Sanger. She she no longer is no longer alive, but she was the founder of Planned Parenthood. We're going to talk more about that. This is she was a racist, and she founded Planned Parenthood because she wanted to eliminate those races that were not good. She said, colored people are like human weeds and need to be exterminated. Today, Black Lives Matter, Ku Klux Klan, these, these organizations are racist at their core. And this, th this whole idea is a very bad idea. So what's happened, what's happened to, um, to mankind that we are, so, we are so polarized on the basis of race? Well, what's happened is that um, God made man in his image. Now, if we weren't made in the image of God originally, we would have been good. But something happened, and that something that happened was described in Genesis 3 where it said sin entered the world. So because man is a sinner, this whole idea of the superiority of one person over another has come into being. And this idea, uh, this idea is not prevalent today, but the idea that man is really good, inherently good, how, long have you, how much have you heard that? I mean, it's a very common thing. It's taught all the, over the place. But the Bible says man is inherently evil. Man is inherently, he's not inherently good because sin has entered into the world. When I was... Um, when I was in college and just starting to understand what it meant to be a Christian, I remember uh, I went to this uh, a church that I'd been advised to go to, and, and that pastor was somewhat a mentor to me. Now, he wasn't a great creationist. He, he was a Bible man, but he didn't know much about creation evolution, and he allowed me to be a theistic evolutionist. I mean, he screwed up, but, but he's a good man. He actually married my wife and I. But I remember going to his church, and as I was starting to grow in my faith, being in a... Um, being in a, a Wednesday, Wednesday evening Bible study. So we're sitting in this circle, and, and I'm, what, I'm maybe 20 at that time, and there's all these older people around, and I remember saying, well, man's basically good, and, and really, 
the, the room went quiet, and then there was this bum, 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 bum. Those were the false teeth falling out of these people. Because this, you know, the, 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 here's this upstart kid, and he's telling, telling these people that know better, that people are basically good. That's what I thought. That's what I had been, that's what I had been taught that man was basically good. And this idea that man is basically good is an erroneous thing. That's a, that's a trick of the devil. Man is basically bad, and it's only by being transformed to the image of Christ are we going to be good. So we, we, have, to be, we have to be on our guard that we don't fall into that trap. I fell into that trap for a long time, and it took me a while to understand that man is, is basically evil, not basically good. Romans reminds us of that when it says, For all have sinned and fall short of the glory of God. We have to be renewed every day in, in the Lord's Spirit. Not that we have to be saved every day, but we're sinners. And um, I don't know about you, but, um, you know... Well, we won't ask my wife, but probably more than once I've already sinned today. Sin leads us into pride, and pride that I'm better than somebody else leads to this idea of racism. So, one of the things that we need to do as a church, as Christian people, we need to get rid of this idea of races because it's a divisive type of idea. It's been promoted recently for political gains. But it's a bad idea and we need to get rid of this whole idea of races and realize that we're all part of the human race. Now at breakfast this morning, we're sitting at this table and over here is sitting, and we're with we're three ladies right in front of us. And so we're trying to find out where they're from. And they said, well, you tell us where we're from. See who's the African, who's, who's this and this and this. We did, we did pretty poor with that, that line of questioning. But it was interesting that we talked about that. They didn't know I was going to talk about this issue today. And um, we're all of one human race. We're made in the image of God that, that subsequently has fallen because of sin. So we need to keep this idea that we're all of one race. So let's think about this idea, and we're going to put it in quotes because I don't want us to perpetuate this idea. There are people groups around the world, but we're all of one race. We're all of one race. So how do we get this idea of races today? Well, we're all descended from Adam. That means we're all of one race. We're all of one blood. That means our DNA is basically all the same. Now there's differences between, I mean, none of our DNA is the same. Absolutely none, but the majority of, of our DNA is similar. It's more similar than it is to a banana or a monkey or anything else. We're all made of the same stuff. <clears throat> Acts 17, 26 says, and some of the translations will say this differently, but it says, from one man he made every nation. Some of the translations say, we are from, of one blood. We are of one blood. He made all nations from one blood. So we need to get this idea of people groups more in our mind. Something happened, though, in history that, that changed this idea of one race. One race one people group, and that was the flood. Because man's in, inherent um, desire was to be stronger, to be prideful. And so because of that, they wanted to stay together. And so after the flood, the Tower of Babel was a result of that. At the flood, though, remember there were millions of people at the time of the flood. All of those people were destroyed except for eight and basically, those three women, the three wives of, of uh, Noah's sons, became the, um, the perpetuators of all the people groups of the world. I'm going to show you some really interesting things in just a few minutes about that. But 
So there was a million people, one, per one person at the beginning, millions of people, came back down to eight people, basically three women, and then we have all these people groups descending from that, and those, those people groups didn't want to become separate. And the Tower of Babel experience, God said, I ask you, I commanded you to spread throughout the earth, and you didn't do it, so I'm going to screw up your languages, and you're going to have to move apart. <clears throat> so they went to different locations. And as they went to different locations, there was a, there's basically a subset of people that migrated here, migrated here, migrated here, and those people could speak the same language, but they also found that, that some of them couldn't thrive in that, loca in that locality. If you, take, if you take these guys from, uh, from, uh, from Minnesota and you put them down in Ethiopia, they're going to have trouble. And, and, and their offspring are going to have trouble because they're going to get skin cancers. They're not going to do well in all that, with all that sun. They do pretty good in Minnesota. But they don't do well down there. So they would say, well, we, this isn't a good place for us. We're going to move back to Minnesota. But the, some people were able to thrive in Ethiopia. Some people were able to thrive in these different areas. But what happened was that they started to inbreed, if you would. And when you do that, when you get isolation, then you get the occurrence of certain traits that will come out. And, and those traits will become more prominent. And over time, those will change even features of that people group at that area from those guys up in Minnesota that look different. And so all of a sudden we have um, external differences that we start associating with races. They're people groups. It's all a natural thing, um, um, but it's a result of that isolation. <clears throat> so that's how we got this idea of races today, because of the spreading out, the isolation, the inbreeding, certain traits started to become more prominent. <clears throat> But the idea that these people are different or they're lower, that's a, that's, that's a bad concept. Remember, when you think about evolution, what's happened over time? Things have changed over time. Man has changed over time. And the whole, everything has changed over time. What, we agree that things change. But what's happened with evolution is that more primitive things were in the past. And now, now, we're better than those primitive, uh, those primitive people and those primitive ideas. That's evolution for you. That's, that's a non-Christian idea. God had a chosen people, but you look at the genealogy of Jesus, and there are a lot of other people groups other than the Jews involved in that genealogy. God loves everyone, and he loves them all the same because they're made in his image not because they look a certain way. <clears throat> so we need to keep this idea there's only one race, and that's the human race. So let's look at this idea of early man. Uh, you know, I mentioned cavemen a, a, a couple times ago, but what about early man? <clears throat> what we find when we look at early man, well, from a biblical standpoint, what was, what's early man? Well, it's Adam, it's Noah, it's uh, Jacob. It's all of those guys are early men. What, what was be, who was before Adam? The Bible says there was nobody before Adam. Adam was the first man. He was made on day six, and that and the Bible will tell us as we looked at before that was about six thousand years ago. Did man come from something else? No. So right off the bat, we can say there were no earlier men than Adam. There were either apes, which were made on the same day, or humans. But one didn't come from the other. Uh, he he, he emphasize, emphasizes that in Genesis 1, where he says, I made man separate from all the other animals because I made him in my image. No question about it, man did not come from something else. So when we see, when we see these early men like Lucy, well, see, I should have said early woman. But uh, 
actually there's a question whether Lucy really was a man or a woman. But, but um, nonetheless, when we look at these Australopithecus type fossils, and evolutionists would say those are our precursors, we can point to the Bible and say our precursor is Adam, and he was made perfect in God's image, and he had no precursor. We have a display about Lucy at the museum. Some of you have seen that display. Um, I, I just want to emphasize it for a minute because it shows how the world wants to deceive us. Um, when, you, when you think of Lucy from uh, Wikipedia or from textbooks, you see Lucy depicted as a um, short, thin, uh, upright female. She's got normal feet. Yeah, human hands, normal meaning human feet, human hands. You look closely at her face, um, she has normal features. She doesn't have glasses on, but, but you get the idea. There, she's made to look like a human. In the museum, we've taken that same information and that, and that means those certain bones that we find. Fossil record doesn't show us any hands of Lucy. It doesn't show us any feet of Lucy. Lucy, Lucy was given the name Lucy because the Beatles song, In the Sky with Lucy, whatever that, that was playing at the time when they found those bones. That's why she's named Lucy. And so they made a, they've made a picture of what they'd like to see a human ancestor to be. Do you know what color Lucy's eyes are in the evolutionary, from an evolutionary standpoint? They're, they have white sclera. Now, some of you guys have bloodshot sclera, but, but in general, our sclera is white. Apes are brown or black. These are the subtle things that we see all the time, that our kids see all the time, that influence us to say, oh, that's early man. Why does she have human feet? Why does she? Well, because if she's, if she's our um, uh, ancestor, she must have walked upright. And lo and behold, in another part of Africa, a thousand miles away, there are some footprints in the same strata of earth where Lucy was found, and those are human footprints. Oh my goodness, she must have human feet. You see how this all works? You start putting these pieces together and you, and you say, she didn't have human feet, but we see human foot, we see human imprints in the fossil record, and we say it's the same level, so she must have human feet. That's bogus. Maybe it means that humans lived at the same time that this ape lived. Doesn't mean that she had human feet, but we've been brainwashed into those ideas. So, what we know is that man is either fully human or ape. We have no, we have no transitions bef between one or the other. The, and, and the Bible would say that we, it's impossible to have transitions, but the fossil record certainly doesn't show that. We can theorize that, but we don't have any. Some of these early men are outright frauds. It's interesting that, remember, you, you've probably read about the Scopes monkey trial back in the early 1900s. Well, at the time of the Scopes monkey trial, there was a find. There was a find. There was a, a fossil find. And it proved that man came from this, prehist from this prehistoric animal. And it was all based upon a tooth that was found in Nebraska. But it happened just at the time of that, of that uh, trial. And so it influenced some of the outcome of that trial. Turns out it was a pig's tooth. But that didn't come out till later on. The devil works in subtle ways. Be careful of new finds that show you something new. Oftentimes they're outright frauds. Piltdown Man was a, was a contrived fraud that was a combination of, of an ape and a, and, a, and a human. And that jaw was filed down and, and, and made to look like 
it, it was something that it wasn't. And that's, that Pilsdown man was put up as an example of that transition form for years. But it was a fraud. So you either have fully human or you have fully apes and you have frauds and then you have, then you have some of these that you grew up with, Neanderthal, Cro-Magnon man. What are, those, what are those guys? Well, Neanderthal is a, is, a group of, is a group of people that have been found now, not, not just in Germany where they were originally found, but all, really all over the world. They're a type of person that has a, a larger brain capacity. They tend to be stooped over. Um, they are pictured as these old brutes, these, these early man brutes. That's what Neanderthal was thought to be. We know now that those, those people were fully human. We know that um, it looks like from looking at DNA uh, samples that they interbred with other people groups. We, we know that their, their, um, their stoopness was, pro was a cause because they had arthritis. They lived to be a long, to, for a long time. These are post-flood people. Remember, the ages fall down over time. These are older people. They have arthritis. They, they, it looks like they have rickets. Some of the skeletons show evidence of rickets, degenerative type disease. So that's what you'd expect them to find. But you also find them with arts and burying their, their, their dead and doing things that humans normally do. So that now everyone realizes that Neanderthal are really humans. They're just a, it was just a group that, that were probably post-flood, early, early post-flood people. But if you put a suit on them and walk them down the street, they would look like anybody else. I mean, we all look different, but they would look like any other human. So Neanderthal, uh, Neanderthal's full of human. Cro-Magnum was thought to be a little more recent to us, but again, completely human. Now, we sang a song today. This is really funny. The Lord has a sense of humor. We sang a song today. Um, would, would you look up that song again uh, in your book? It's on page 256. I, I want to just look at that for a second. Just look at page 256. And tell me, wh who wrote that song? Yeah, jo Johannes Neander wrote that. Who was, who was this guy? He was a pastor. Got this? He was a pastor who loved to walk up and down his valley. He was loved by the people. He, he produced many songs. And because he was so well known in that area, they named the valley Neander Valley. And lo and behold, that's where they found the first Neanderthal man. This evolutionary intermediate. Isn't that interesting? Here's a pastor, and he gets this prehistoric man named after him, and it's a joke. It's not true at all. So whenever you sing that song, that's why we sang that song this morning, you think of Johannes uh, and Neander, and that's the story behind that. That's the, the Paul Harvey of this whole thing. Well, well, what about cavemen? I mean, you know, cavemen are very popular because they've, they've, um, they've made it to Super Bowl commercials and all kinds of stuff. But anyway, who are cavemen? Well, cavemen are people that lived in caves. Hmm. Now, we talked about caves a couple of sessions ago. When, are the, when were the caves, when were the caves created? These are post-flood uh, st structures. These are things that existed after the flood. These are things that are about, at the most, 4,500, 4,000 4, some years old. They're not millions of years old. They're not the hundreds of thousands. Of, these are young things. So people, after the flood and after the Tower of Babel, were dispersed. And they went to live in different places. And they found different kinds of shelters. And some of those people, this is, remember, during the Ice Age, some of those people lived in, cage, in cages. That's right. Some, excuse me. Some of them lived in caves. 
Some of them lived in caves. We have people that live in caves today. I had a partner who built his house partly underground because he wanted to use the natural cooling and, and heating mechanism of the earth as an energy efficient place to live. So cavemen, again, this is an evolutionary type, evolutionary type term that's been degraded to say all oh, these people are less than human. Cavemen are people that live in caves. People live in caves today. David, what did David do when he was out running from Saul? Mm, let's see, he lived in caves. Okay? Cavemen, that's a derogatory idea. Just the same as racism, a derogatory idea. These are not biblical things. Cavemen or men or women that lived in caves. They're not prehistoric. Now let's talk about prehistoric for a minute. What is prehistoric? What's prehistoric? What's prehistoric from an evolutionary standpoint? Well, prehistoric says it's before things were written down. It's before we had a history of things. Because those people were so stupid, they didn't really. What does the Bible say? When, what's prehistoric from a Bible standpoint? Prehistoric from a Bible standpoint is God. That's all. There was nothing before that. By the time Adam gets on the scene, he's communicating. He's talking with God. He's writing down things that God tells him to do. There's no such thing as prehistoric from a biblical standpoint. That's an evolutionary type term. We've got to be careful. This has crept into everything. And it's it's all part of this. Um, it's all part of the scheme of the devil. We have to realize that this this evolutionary idea permeates all areas of our life. So prehistoric is a term that we don't want to use. There is no such thing to a Christian as a prehistoric idea, unless you want to talk about the eternal nature of God. That's all. Don't talk about prehistoric otherwise. Okay. All right. So let's look a little bit more. At at the human race. And this is an interesting picture because you look at this picture and you see different characteristics. You see different characteristics. These characteristics have to do with the same DNA that's now been isolated in different people groups and so certain traits have become more prominent. So we're not going to use this idea of racism so much anymore. We're going to use this term people group. So where where did people groups come from? Because there are a lot of people groups. We wrote a book, Our People at Answers in Genesis. Ken Ham wrote with this guy, Charles Ware, who's a, uh, who's a preacher and a Bible college president from Indianapolis, a black man who married to a white woman, involved in racial reconciliation in the, in the city of, of uh, Indianapolis. They wrote this book, One Race, One Blood. So... Basically, they're saying this, and this is what we need to say. There's an original recipe, and that recipe came from Adam and Eve, and all these people groups came from that same recipe. So, what color was Adam and Eve? What color was Adam and Eve? What color are you? Am I white? I'm not white. I mean, as the summer goes on, I get more and more brown. Um, now, my hair gets more and more white. That's, that's true. But we don't know the color that Adam and Eve were, except that we know some parameters from our study of genetics. In order to get all different people groups, they had to have the ability, because there's nothing new after God created man. There's, there's nothing new from that. There's, nothing, there's not a new kind. So for Adam and Eve to have all of us as their ancestors and to have all of our different um, shades of colors in our skin, they had to have certain characteristics. And, they, uh, and, and we're just going to do a little experiment here with you. Um, there may be more than this, but we're going to assume that there are two genes that code for skin color, A and B. Big A is dominant, little A is recessive. Uh, 
and, and so we're going to say there's two genes, A and B, dominant, recessive of each of those kinds. <clears throat> and so if we, if we assume that and we say that Adam and Eve were such a mixture that we can get all that we have today, that, meant, that means they had to be heterozygous, meaning that they had to have a little bit of this and a little bit of this. They couldn't have been all big A, big B. They couldn't have been that or you never would have gotten little, any little A's or little, any little B's at all. So we assume that and then we run this through a genetic um, um, calculation that we call the Punnett square and we'll see what kind of colors we get from these two people. So hang in, hang in here with me for a minute. This is, not, this is, this is pretty simple but it may be new to some of you. So if you, when you cross, when you, when you have the, the union of a man and a female, male and a female, you take those, that sperm and the egg, they have half the amount of genetic information that their parents had. Those, 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 those uh, sex cells have half the amount of DNA and they recombine to get a total. We all have 46 chromosomes. Those, those, th those are half. Each of those things have half, and so when we combine them, we can combine them in this way. If they're heterozygous, that means that some of those, some of those, um, some of those eggs were a, had A, B. Some of them had big A, little B. Okay, the same for Adam and Eve. They both had all of those parts in, in their DNA. And so when you cross them, this is a very simple exercise. You just come down and you say, you get big A and big B, you get big A, big B. That's all you can get. There's no way you can get these two gametes, these two egg and sperm, to give you little A or little B. No way. Zero. So we know, because we have all different shades of skin color, we know that Adam and Eve were not this. That makes sense. Look at the other side now. What um, because they're heterozygous, we have the different kinds. Some of their g gametes have little a, little b, little a, little b, and when those cross, we only get little a, little b. We will never get this from this because when you divide this up, there's no big big a's and no big b's. So we can say we can say with certainty that Adam and Eve were some heterozygous type of mixture. Whatever that is, we're assuming it's just these two genes. But look what you get when you cross, when you cross Adam and Eve and you say statistically, what, you, what do you get? Well, if you have three bigs and one little, three bigs and one little, you get four, and, and this is 16, out of those 16, you get a quarter of those that are going to be a dark brown. That's how the colors, realize this is a simple example. That's what we're trying to get. Now, <clears throat> you'll also find that if you get, um, besides those dark browns, you get some that have a big A, big B, little A, little B, or, um, or you get two big A's and two little B's. So basically what we're saying here is that you have two big babies and two, or not babies, that's the wrong, two big uh, letters and two little letters. And that gives you a predominance of six. You get six of this brown color. That's what this square will tell you. And then, just to go on, if you have one big letter, okay, this is really simple. If I was in genetics, they'd be grading me down right now. But anyway, you get, again, you get four light brown. So you get one completely white that can only produce w more white. You get one completely black, can only produce more black, and then you get these heterozygous groups in here with a predominant of being this, this brown color that has two and two. Th th that's simple genetics, assuming that skin color is only from two, two, different, um, two different genes. So that's how you could get all these different skin colors from Adam and Eve. It's not hard. It's not hard. It's, it's scientifically sound, and it explains how we have these different color groups. And it also explains how you can have twins that come out one black and one white. 
you know, relatively black and white. You can have two, these are from, th these are twins from these same parents, I'm different parents, but that's, these are the twins that result. Because we are one blood. We are the human race. We have different gene types, and those give us some different characteristics, but these are not, these are not fakes. This is, this is what you'll see in families. Okay, you get the idea? So the genetics idea, the coloration, if you would, and we, we could do the same thing with, with the slant of your eyes or the folds or your uh, kind of hair that you have. Any of these areas that are coded by in, with ge, from genetics, we could do that same type of study with this Punnett square and see how we can get all this variation. Now what about population numbers? What happens when we look at population estimates and see if man's really been around for hundreds of millions of years, well, 200 million years, we've said, but if, if, it's been a, if he's been around for a long time versus 6,000 years. Well, this is the population of the world now, about 7.6 billion people. <clears throat> Uh, estimates of the world population in the past, we don't have, we don't have, um, I don't, it's not even in the uh, Library of Congress, we do not have the first census. But we know that the first census says there was one man. You don't have to go to the Library of Congress to do that. Okay, there was one, so that's, <clears throat> so 4,000 BC, 6,000 years ago there was one man. We know that. We, we estimate that before the flood there were millions of people. After the flood, there was only eight. One to millions to eight. We're going to look at this a little bit more in a minute, but it's interesting how these population estimates go. At the time of Abraham, there was about a million people. Remember how many people uh, Moses took when he left Egypt? Took a lot of people. Took a lot of people. The Bible says there were about two million men that went with him. So populations can, they can explode very quickly time of Christ, there were about 300 million, estimated 300 million people in the world. 18, 18 AD, it's estimated there was a billion people. Now, now, someone's not doing a census, but these are estimates, and these are pretty much accepted numbers. By, 1906, by 1960, there were about 3 billion. 87, there were 5 billion. Today, 7.6 billion. So, how do we account for this? How do we account? Darwin says we had these ape-like creatures that went to early man. Early man, they weren't very smart. Pretty soon they became Africans or Aborigines or some other people group that were inferior because they're on the scale leading to the smart, the smart race. That's what, that's what Darwin thought. That's what Hitler thought. That's what Mussolini thought. That's what Mao thought. That's what these dictators, that they're superior to everyone else. That's the basis for this oppression and killing of people. <clears throat> well, evolutionists says that man basically evolved some, some form of man about two million years ago. So if that's the case, let's just think, let's just give them that for a minute and say, if that happened two million years ago, would we expect to find some trace of um, early tools? Maybe some things about what they built? Sure, we'd expect to find that. But what do we find? Even if you estimate a 2% growth rate, which is very moderate, there should have been many, many, many more people than those estimates that I told you about many more people and many more artifacts left over from those people than we find today. So we don't find that and there's something wrong from a population standpoint with the evolutionary view of man. Pretty simple. What about the Bible? The Bible says be fruitful and multiply. Increase in number. Fill the earth. Psalm 127 says the sons are a heritage from the Lord. Children a reward from him. Like arrows in the hands of a warrior are sons born in one's youth. Blessed is the man whose quiver is full of them. The biblical time frame 
of thousands of years is consistent with the population estimates that we see today. Those are evolutionary estimates. They're out of line completely with evolutionary ideas, but they're consistent with the biblical time frame. And that's, that's interesting. Okay. So let me show you some interesting recent scientific studies. <clears throat> Recently it's been found, and, and you've heard somewhat about this anyway, that we know that DNA, you know, DNA is a fairly new thing. Darwin knew nothing about DNA. He knew nothing about DNA. It wasn't until 19, around 1960 that Francis and Crick discovered this, discovered, described this double helix form of, of these chemicals that turns out to be the basis of our genes, it's DNA, a specialized molecule. They also found it in the mitochondria. The mitochondria, you know, mitochondria? Mitochondria are the energy systems of the cell. They're a little organelle within the cell, not in the nucleus, but they're in, the, um, in this, this organelle called a mitochondria. That's, the, that's where they make a lot of energy. Mitochondrial DNA, this is a real interesting part, only found in females. Only, you don't find mitochondrial DNA in males. Hmm. What does that mean? Why is that? Well, science would tell us that if you trace back mitochondrial DNA, it goes back to one, you can go back and trace it to one DNA set from a female. And that's what they call this African Eve. They say all people, all people originated from this one female. Well, her name might have been Eve. It's interesting that the evolutionists call her Eve. Where, where did they borrow that from? They didn't get that from Charles Darwin. They got it because they bought it, borrowed it from the Bible. So that's interesting. Maybe one common DNA source they can trace back with these mitochondrial um, uh, um, uh, examinations. But here's another interesting thing. Now, this is fairly recent. As they try to trace and they map now DNA, the DNA of different people groups around the world, they haven't done everybody. I mean, they didn't come and ask Bob if they could trace his, well, they wouldn't eat anyway because he's not a female. But they didn't come and ask you if you could, they could trace your mitochondrial DNA. But they've done studies all over the world and they find that those DNA things come to three, come from three things. It was one, and then they see it comes to three, and then, lo and behold, everything goes out. What does that mean? Man, this, this needs to get creationists and this needs to get Bible-believing Christians excited because there was a time when there were three women. That's three women that were giving birth and populating the, the uh, population of the earth. Those were the three wives of Noah. And so a guy at our, at our, at the Institute, our, he was at the Institute for Creation Research, now he's with the Answers in Genesis. His name is Nathaniel Jeanson. He just wrote a book uh, about Darwin. It says, Replacing Darwin. Because he's, this book that he's just written says Darwin knew nothing about genetics. And genetics is blowing the foundation away from evolution. And these, this, is the, this is a diagram from his book that says, when we trace these different DNA, mitochondrial DNA things, we get three nodes consistent with, the, consistent with these three wives of Noah's sons. I don't know about you, but your spine should be tingling, tingling by now. He also said that we can, trace, we can trace the number of changes that we see in mitochondrial DNA. So if you only go back, if you only go back 200,000 years and you estimate how many mitochondrial DNA changes you should have, you should have just roughly less than 500 by and that's for 200,000 years. How many would you expect to find if you um, went back 6,000 years? Well, these are, these are rough numbers, but basically, uh, in the most recent issues of that Answers magazine, Jenison has an article in there, and he says, you're going to expect on the average about 80. That's what we estimate. That's what we predict from our theory. Remember, science is about 
running experiments to, to see if their predictions are true. Evolution says we predict there will be about 500 mitochondrial DNA changes if, if man's only 200,000 years old. The Bible says man's 6,000 years old, and we, when we predict on that basis, we get about 80 mitochondrial changes. And what do we find? What do we actually find? We find about 80 mitochondrial changes. What? You see what that's saying? It's saying that this idea that the Bible is true, my goodness, that's really true. It doesn't line up. Genetics doesn't line up with evolution. And that's what Jenison is saying. It's time to replace Darwin and get with an idea that makes sense. Okay. All right, let's look at a couple other things briefly. We said we're going to have time for questions. We have to make sure we do that. But what about life? This is a moral issue. What about life? <clears throat> Creation says that life begins at conception. When that egg and sperm come together, you have a unique DNA individual. You have a person. The Bible talks about that person in Psalms and Jeremiah, where it, where it talks about, you formed me in my mother's womb. You know, they're, not, they're not talking about a, a, a one-year-old. They're not talking about it. They're, they're talking about that conception when that egg and sperm got together. They're not doing what, um, remember that the guy from Cornell that I showed you a couple days ago that said there's nothing, there's nothing to life except what we have now. He's the same guy that says don't, don't consider that person a person until they've grown a little bit and we see whether we want them. Otherwise, we're going to get rid of them. That's Peter, that's Peter Sang. That's Peter, um, uh, his name's skipping my mind right now. But those people exist. These are evolutionists. They don't value life the way that creation does. The Bible says it's also sacred that all life, even unborn life, old life, all life is sacred. Why? Because it's made in the image of God. God said in Exodus, he says, because you're made in the image of God, if you take life, the government is going to take your life. That's where capital punishment comes from. Evolution says, um, we're just going to decide, we're going to take a vote, and it's going to be based on who's the strongest, and it's just going to be convenience-guided. Um, man's just another animal. Uh, they're disposable. It doesn't mean anything. There's a huge difference on how evolutionists and creationists look at life. Eugenics was a movement that said, let's, let's do things to influence how human life can be better. So th that's a natural outcome of evolutionary thought. If, if man is getting better and better and better with time, then let's see if we can speed that process up. And so this eugenics movement started after Darwin, <clears throat> and it was an idea to say, let's see if we can improve the human race by our genetic control. So a guy who was a half-cousin of Charles Darwin, this guy by the name of Francis Galton, was a, a premier guy in that time. It was a natural cons consequence of the survival of the fittest. Terrible things were done in the name of eugenics. Terrible things were done. Margaret Sanger was a prodigy of this whole idea. And she wanted to control, she wanted to control populations and the birth so that we could eliminate those races that were bad, that were pre that were that were not smart enough. And so she became associated with birth control and in nineteen 42 was the found that, that that whole idea morphed into Planned Parenthood of today. Planned Parenthood, I think we need to look at this because this is a terrible, terrible group. Um, in 2014, their budget was 1.3 billion. Is yours, is Teen Mission's budget close to that? Yeah, it's a little under that. Little under. <laughs> one third of that, one third of that's coming out of your pocket because it's coming from the federal government. One third of their, their budget comes from the, the profits. In, in, 19, in 2014, 324,000 abortions were done in this country. Now, that's hard to get a hold of, but think about this. One abortion was occurring every 90 seconds. 
every 90 seconds, another life is snuffed out by abortion. Since 1973, when the Supreme Court decided that abortion was legal, there have been 60 million abortions in the United States since that time. 60 million abortions in the U.S. since a screwed up ruling of what, what's important about life was handed down. In the world, there have been 2 billion abortions um, performed since 1973. This is a totally corrupt system that has really evolved, that's come about because of evolutionary principles. Margaret Sanger said this, the most merciful thing that a large family, some of you have large families, the most merciful thing that a large family does to one of its infant members is to kill it. Okay, finally let's look at sexuality for a minute. This, this is important, this is very important today, and um, we'll entertain some questions about this if you want, but what does uh, creation say about sexuality? It's, the Bible says that God made male and female. He made them from the beginning, male and female. He made them both in the image of God. He made them both equal, although man had a pain in his side after that. But, but basically they were equal when God made them. God created marriage. He made that marriage to be between a man and a woman. He blessed that marriage. He used that example over and over, even in his relationship with the church. God blessed marriage. Sin brought about shame with sexuality. What's the first thing that they what's the first thing that Adam and Eve did after they um, after they sinned in the Garden of Eden? Well, they went and got some I was going to say palm leaves, but that wouldn't do it. They got some banana leaves and tried to something like that and tried to make clothes to cover their shame. Shame came from sin. God condemns and he condemns it very clearly. He condemns adultery. It happens. It happened but he condemns it. And he condemns homosexuality um, many, many places in the Bible, in the Old and New Testament. Evolution, what do they say about sexuality? They say, wow, well, it just changes with time. You know, the society changes. We don't have any absolutes. So whatever, whatever people want, that's what we do. Those are different. Those are different concepts of sexuality. We need to understand that this idea of evolution is taking us down a bad course, even when it comes to sexuality. So, what about some questions like, what about homosexual marriage? Well, the Bible says it's sin. So, there's no question, that's, that's no. What about polygamy? The Bible says that one man, one woman for life, polygamy is, is a sin, no. What about transgender ideas? Have you, have you ever seen a transgender person uh, send in their DNA sample to 23andMe after they decided to be a different sex? No, they're not going to do that. Their DNA hasn't changed. They haven't changed at all. Because they think that these things are relative, they can change how they look at themselves as male or female. That's wrong. It's a sin. There's just no getting around. It's a sin. So Christians can't condone that type of behavior. What about this whole LGBTI? I think the, the letters go on beyond this, but basically <laughs> it's a sin. It's a sin. We have to, Christians, we have to realize it's a sin. We have to call it out as a sin. So it's no. Well, what about homosexual people? We have to realize that those are sinful people like us. Sinful people for whom Christ died. The church should welcome those people and help them become more Christ-like. It doesn't mean we ostracize them. It doesn't mean we burn them at the stake. It doesn't mean we do it. It means that we help them become more Christ-like. That's, that's the difference between evolution and creation. There's huge differences, and we need to own up to that. So in summary... There's a clear divide between creation and evolution when it comes to moral issues. I've just touched on four. The clear divide. You cannot be a create. You cannot be a. You cannot be an evolutionist 
and hold those ideas and be a biblical creationist. Those are contrary. When you say, I'm a, I'm a, I'm a theistic evolutionist, that's an oxymoron when you think about it. Those things cannot go together. Christians must rely on the power of God's word, the Bible, as the final authority in all matters. That includes even today's and future societal issues that, that are stumbling blocks to people. The Bible is the final authority on racism. It's the final authority on, you know, it's the final authority on everything. The Bible trumps everything else. <coughs> Okay. All right. We've got minus seven minutes to ask questions. <laughs> um, I'm really sorry that I that I went on too long, but anyway. yes. You know, I'm really I get upset, confused. I had a sister-in-law visiting us, and she cut her hand. I could not get her hand operated on or fixed at the hospital. But yet I have...